So Father Damaskinos Olkinuora of the monastery of Xenofondos on the Holy Mountain has become one of the leading lights in academic reflection on the liturgy, bringing together deep practical experience as a chanter and academic credentials and interests. Father Damaskinos serves as lecturer, university lecturer in systematic theology and patristics at the School of Theology of the University of Eastern Finland. His educational background includes opera, early music, classics, and theology. And he's also known as a performer of Byzantine chant, both in his native Finland and on the Holy Mountain, where he belongs to the monastic brotherhood of Xenophondos. Since 2004, he has worked on the translation of Byzantine chant into Finnish, Estonian, and Swedish, and his ensembles have made several recordings of Byzantine chant in Finnish. Nowadays, his scholarly interests include Byzantine hymnography and homiletics, and he's particularly intrigued by the connections between different ecclesiastical arts. On behalf of my colleagues, I can say I'm truly delighted and honored to have him as one of the main speakers of our SVS ISOCM Summer Music Institute this year. He will also tell you a little bit more about himself at the beginning of his recorded lecture, which I had the pleasure of hearing in advance. The lecture is titled, Byzantine Hymnography for the Annunciation, an Auditory, Visual, Diachronic, and Emotional Dialogue. Please welcome Father Damaskinos Olkinuora. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the possibility to talk in this important event. And at the same time, I must apologize. I cannot be physically uh, with, present with you. This year seems to be full of conferences postponed because of the pandemic. So I have to be here in Greece in Thessaloniki, giving a plenary lecture at another conference uh, on liturgical studies the same week. I should also say a few words about myself and my approaches to scholarship, something that is very much influenced by my background, because this probably will make you understand better why I see things in the way I see. I am actually not really a theologian. My first university training was in voice and early music, and my second one was classics, specializing in Greek philology. It was only during my PhD when I was formally trained in theology. But in addition to my formal training, I also have an ecclesiastical training, of course. I was an active Orthodox Church musician since my teenage years, and I am nowadays also a monk at the Athonite Monastery of Xenophondos, dividing my time between Greece and my native Finland, where I teach systematic theology and patristics at the University of Eastern Finland. I am also a practicing iconographer, though with very little time nowadays to dedicate, dedicate myself to this very demanding art. But this varied background has in many ways guided me in my scholarly path as well. My personal experience of the liturgical tradition of our church in both Finland and Greece and the Holy Mountain in particular, coupled with the academic training in different fields, has always made me find interest in the interconnections between different languages, arts, and traditions. Therefore, in 2015, I finished my doctoral thesis titled Byzantine Hymnography for the Feast of the Entrance of the Theotokos, an Intermedial Approach, where I studied the liturgical hymns of this feast and their connections with iconography, Byzantine sermons, and music. I will show you my PowerPoint. As a result of my studies, I created this diagram to demonstrate the interconnections between hymnography and other literary genres and the space and time, in other words, acoustics, iconography and music that affect the way we understand hymns. In Byzantine liturgy, the performed texts consist of the scriptures, patristic writings such as sermons and hymnography. Noticeably absent from this list, uh, the texts that we often call apocrypha, but which we should perhaps more accurately be called quasi-canonical texts when we deal with texts that had an influence on Orthodox thinking, 
are mostly not explicitly performed in a liturgical context, despite their influence on the latter two types of text. So the upper part of the diagram represents the textual level where biblical texts, including the so-called apocrypha, which are in turn inspired by canonical texts, act as an authorized, or in the case of apocrypha, quasi-authorized inspiration for patristic texts, mainly homilies and hymnography. However, all of these literary genres, excluding the apocrypha perhaps, are performed in the liturgy. This is depicted in the lowest level of the diagram. And performance consists of numerous factors, the performance itself as an action affected by its liturgical context, both in the framework of the particular service or the liturgical year, and in the case of hymnography and some biblical texts, the musical composition superimposed on the text when it exists that plays a leading role. So it is through this method, intermediality, that I talk to you today. As you can see, my topic is Byzantine hymnography for the Annunciation, an auditory visual diachronic and emotional dialogue. Many of the observations I present today are included in a forthcoming article on the Annunciation Canon, though I have expanded and developed my ideas for this talk. Though the Dormition perhaps holds the most prominent liturgical position among Marian feasts in the Byzantine ecclesiastical year, it is the Annunciation that underlines most the importance of Mary to the whole church. The Feast of the Annunciation celebrated at least since the 6th century Constantinople on March uh, 25th celebrates the visitation of Archangel Gabriel at Virgin Mary's house in Nazareth, as the Gospel of Luke tells us. The dialogue between the divine messenger and the future birth giver of God could well be called a dialogue par excellence. This moment, the beginning of our salvation and the starting point of God's incarnation, inspired many poets, hymnographers, painters, and preachers to deliver their interpretation of this discussion in their respective art forms. It is these dialogues we will delve into today. As a literary device, dialogue was extremely prominent in Byzantium, and that is probably the reason why the dialogue of the Annunciation was reproduced in so many ways. In the fifth century, the Byzantine Empress Eudocia wrote her Homeric centos, stitchings of Homeric verses to form the gospel narrative, where she also included a passage on the Annunciation. In the Greek speaking world, Romanos the Melodist, again in the sixth century, was the first to create a hymnographic dialogue between Mary and Gabriel, while he based his style on his Syriac predecessors. Subsequent dialogical ethopia, as we say in Greek, where the author assumes the voice of the persons of the narrative, appears in the works by Sophronius of Jerusalem, Andrew of Crete, and Germanos of Constantinople, for instance, who have included such dialogues in their homilies on the Annunciation. The Annunciation was also a prominent theme in the so-called Lives of the Virgin, narratives that tell us about the life of the Theotokos. The dialogue form is a particularly striking feature of Byzantine hymnography and has therefore received much scholarly attention. As Mary Cunningham notes, dialogue allows the preacher actually to change the original words and dramatically to convey their hidden meaning. In addition to this, dialogues enliven the celebrated events. Cunningham continues, and I quote, the congregation must soon have been persuaded that these events were taking place again in their midst in the context of their liturgical services associated with the feast day, end of quote. But before proceeding to the liturgical texts themselves, let us remind us about what our evangelist Luke writes for us. He says, and I quote, and in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. 
and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. First of all, we should note that the Gospel of Luke is an ascetical one. And in the early church, there was a tradition that Luke himself lived an ascetical life in celibacy. It is therefore not surprising that he uses such ascetical vocabulary here too. When Mary says, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man, she obviously refers to her virginity. And the angels answer, the Holy Ghost, ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Is not only a description of the way Christ was conceived in her womb, but also notes that Mary was a spirit bearer. In other words, an ascetic. This vocabulary had been used about Jewish ascetics already around Christ's lifetime on earth. We should bear this ascetical undertone in mind when we present the is not only a description of the way Christ was conceived in her womb, but also notes that Mary was a spirit bearer. In other words, an ascetic. This vocabulary had been used about Jewish ascetics already around Christ's lifetime on earth. We should bear this ascetical undertone in mind when we proceed to our hymnographic examples later on. Another important source for Marian thinking, one that came to influence not only the feasts of her birth and entrance, but also the way Annunciation is perceived in the liturgical tradition of the Orthodox Church, is the so-called Proto-Evangelium of James, a second century text, sometimes titled as an apocryphal gospel, but perhaps more suitably called Life of Mary. This text was by and large dealt with as a canonical source in the Orthodox thinking. Here, the Annunciation narrative includes some details that Luke's gospel story does not mention. She is described to weave a scarlet thread for the curtain of the Holy of Holies in the Temple of Jerusalem. And then the narrative tells a kind of first Annunciation. And I quote the Proto Evangelium of James. And she took the pitcher and went out to fill it with water. And behold, a voice, voice saying, Hail, you who hast received grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And she looked round on the right hand and on the left to see whence this voice came. And she went away, trembling to her house, and put down the pitcher. And taking the purple, she sat down on her seat and drew it out. End of quote. And after this, the Proto Evangelium of James includes the second Annunciation. I quote, and behold, an angel of the Lord stood before her, saying, Fear not, Mary, for you have found grace before the Lord of all, and you shall conceive according to his word. And she, hearing, reasoned with herself, saying, Shall I conceive by the Lord, the living God, and shall I bring forth as every woman brings forth? And the angel of the Lord said, Not so, Mary, for the power of the Lord shall overshadow you. Wherefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of the Most High. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And Mary said, Behold the servant of the Lord before his face. Let it be unto me according to your word. End of quote. Shortly after this follows another dialogue in the Proto-Evangelium of James, where Joseph is scandalized about Mary's pregnancy. We could say that the Proto-Evangelium narrative indeed becomes the guiding principle for artistic creation in the following centuries. The Centos by Empress Eudocia that I mentioned before, uh, written in the fifth century, repre represent rather spiritual poetry than hymnography, but they include the theme of the purple thread, which is a very important one. I quote her using the words of Homer. The angel entered an elaborate room. There was the girl sitting on a couch, a footstool supporting her feet. Which is a very important one. I quote her using the words of Homer. The angel entered an elaborate room. There was the girl sitting on a couch, a footstool supporting her feet, and she spun yarn into thread, a wonder to see. 
she was unbroken. The man had not yet brought her under his yoke, end of quote. Another interesting theme in this poem is the way Magra receives the archangel, in other words, with suspicion. I quote again, she was unable to look at him straight, nor could she think, but sat down in silence, bending her heart to his will. Let your word be as you say, but do not be angry at me over this, nor find fault, because I did not welcome you the instant I saw you. For the spirit in my breast is always afraid that some mortal man will come and seduce me with words. As you know, there are many men wilt with evil intent." End of quote. With these words, Mary expresses her will to guard her virginity, showing again her ascetical self, but at the same time, she presents herself at the second Eve, which is interesting. She does not want to be seduced with words, or put otherwise, she does not want to be deceived by Satan. Now, moving along in our diachronic examination of this dialogue, let us go on to the first actual hymn of the Annunciation that I want to discuss, namely the Condagion by the most prominent hymnographer of the sixth century, Romanos the Melodist. This hymn has been recently studied to great extent by my fellow Scandinavian hymnography scholar, Thomas Arendsen, in his thought-provoking book, The Virgin in Song, which I recommend you to read if you're interested in Romanos the Melodist. Even in this poem, Mary is cautious of her visitor, and I quote Romanos. Having said this, the heavenly resident entered under her roof and addressed the august unmarried one. Hail, the Lord is with you. Facing his radiant figure, the girl was hardly bold. She immediately bowed her head to the ground and was quiet. Meaning she typed meaning, thought she joined to thought, and exclaimed, What am I seeing? What shall I think? An appearance of fire, yet a voice of but man has the one before me. He both stirs me and spurs me, and, and, and he speaks thus to me, hail unwedded bride. Such wood of ponderings Mary was piling in her heart when the fiery one breathed, burning her worries like leaves. He said, do not be shaken, radiant one. With the Lord you have found favor. Let not the servant shake you. I have brought you the maker. You are about to bear a son, so how does my fiery look stir you? You are giving birth to the Lord. Why be shaken by your fellow servant? Why do you fear me who trembles before you for the things to come, which were entrusted and confided to me, which I came here and said to you, hail unwedded bride. End of quote. In the end, Mary accepts this message, thanks to the fact that Gabriel knows how to interpret the scriptures. And I quote again, you have really come from on high, forgive me, I see now. I was seized by fear of your beauty, your looks, your voice. They astounded me confusingly. Were you not from above, you would not have interpreted words of scripture, but being from light, you straightened whatever was tangled. Let it be to me then, as you have just said, for you hold the truth, truth, end of quote. Even here, it is interesting that Mary knows the scriptures. She is not a passive and ignorant maiden, but a theologically educated woman. This can be explained by the tradition of the Proto-Evangelium of James, according to which she spent nine years living in the Temple of Jerusalem and learning there the mysteries of God. This also provides a hermeneutical cue to the paradoxicality of Mary and Gabriel's encounter. According to the narrative of the Proto-Evangelium, an angel that, according to the later liturgical sources, became to be identified as Gabriel, fed Mary in the Holy of Holies. So, in the tradition of the church, Mary already knew Gabriel, but she did not want to be deceived. So her thought was maybe someone was impersonating Gabriel. The Kondakion follows the tradition of the Proto-Evangelium also through including a dialogue between Mary and Joseph, but in this case, immediately after Gabriel's visit and not after months of pregnancy, as the Proto-Evangelium says, I quote, the girl summoned Joseph and said, where were you, wise man? How could you not guard my virginity? A winged someone came and gave me pearls for my ears as a gift of betrothal. He hung his words like earrings on me. Look, see how beautiful he has made me, how he adorned me with this. He told me you would tell me in a short while, holy one, hail unwedded bride, end of quote. It is interesting that Mary accuses Joseph for not guarding her virginity. However, I would read this perhaps as an ironic statement. 
It is clear from the next stanza that something special has happened with the Virgin, and I quote again. As Joseph gazed at the divinely adored maiden who was richly favored, he trembled, marveled, astonished, he thought to himself, what kind of being is she? Today she looks nothing like yesterday. Terrifying as weird she appears, the one who is with me is now withholding me. I am staring into burning heat and a snowstorm, a paradise and a furnace, a smoking mountain, a divine flower in bloom, an awesome throne, a pitiable footstool for the one who pities all. Whom I took, I did not seize. How can I even address her, hail and wedded bride? End of quote. And even in the beginning of the next stanza, he asks, and I quote again, both great and lowly, mistress and servant at once, explain what you are. What shall I say? What shall I call you? How can I lord and praise your beauty? Another extensive dialogical hymn for the feast is the canon, sung even today as part of matins, that actually consists of two independent poems. In most Minea, the first part of the poem, up to Ode 7, is attributed to the famous iconophile hymnographer Theophanes, while Odes 8 and 9 are attributed to John, perhaps of Damascus. The division is apparent even through a, through a cursory comparison of the literary style and the structure of the Odes. Ode 8 begins the narrative again from the beginning, and the Diodion formed by the two last Odes, Odes 8 and 9, employs a more complex syntax together with archaism in its vocabulary. Uh, of course, this is something you cannot see from the translations where such linguistic differences are usually evened out. There is an alphabetic acrostic from Odes 1 to 7, beginning each troparium with a new letter, while Odes 8 and 9 present a mirrored alphabetic acrostic. In Ode 8, each verse of the stanzas begins with a new syllable, and in Ode 9, this process happens in reverse. Here is an example from the Ode 8, where you can see that each line uh, of the first stanza begins with a different Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And this is, of course, something you don't see in translations. The textual tradition of the canon is not unanimous regarding the authorship of the hymn. In the printed 19th century Roman Mineon mentions Theophanes and John, but in two early manuscripts, the textual tradition of the canon is not unanimous regarding the authorship of the hymn. In the printed 19th century Roman Mineon mentions Theophanes and John, but in two early manuscripts, from the uh, 10th century and the 12th century, uh, the last two odes are attributed to Cosmas and not John. The Georgian manuscript tradition of this hymn includes the same odes uh, eight and nine as this Greek Mineo, this time without an attribution, so they don't mention who the author was. And odes one to seven consist of a different canon that the Greek version attributed to Theophanes again. The main theme of the canon is naturally similar to that of the gospel narrative and the dialogical form of a sort of debate between uh, Gabriel and Mary, we already saw in Romanos, who on his behalf drew inspiration from Syriac sources, uh, and Syriac took inspiration from early Babylonian uh, literature where these disputation poems are, were very popular. However, the way Mary is presented in the canon differs rather much from the earlier sources. In the biblical narrative, Mary is presented as a submissive and shy young woman, while the canon gives her a voice equal to that of Gabriel. She reveals her deep knowledge of the scriptures and prophecies acquired in the temple of Jerusalem, according to tradition, and I quote, I have learned from the prophet who foretold in times of old the coming of Emmanuel, that a certain holy virgin should bear a child. But I long to know how the nature of mortal men shall undergo union with Godhead. End of quote. She also recognizes her visitor as Gabriel since they became acquainted already in the temple of Jerusalem. And I quote again, O Gabriel, herald of the truth, of the truth, shining with the radiance of Almighty God, tell me truly, how shall I, my purity remaining untouched, bear in the flesh the word that has no body? End of quote. Another reference to the temple is the passage, rich in temple imagery where Mary describes how the Holy Spirit has already purified her. I quote again, the descent of the Holy Spirit has purified my soul and sanctified my body 
It has ma made of me a temple that contains God, a tabernacle divinely adorned, a living sanctuary, and the pure mother of life." End of quote. One of the differences between the Condacium by Romanos and the composite canon that I discuss here is the way Mary's hesitation to receive Gabriel's message is presented. Thomas Arendsen, in his study on the Condacium of the Annunciation, has suggested that in Romanos there is an erotic encounter between Gabriel and Mary. And Arendsen compares this meeting with the story of Chloe and Daphnis, a novel by Longus from around 200 AD, where a young boy and girl learning learn what love is. Rather daringly, in my opinion, Arendsen describes Romanos' poem as including sexual allusions. Gabriel's physical beauty in this case is a reflection of his spiritual beauty. But as I hinted before, this should be read in the widespread tradition of Mary having received an ascetical education in the Temple of Jerusalem. So I actually think there is a bit of irony here and Romanos likes irony. Indeed, the Annunciation Dialogue is presented very explicitly in this light of ascetical discernment of divine apparitions only a century after Romanos, an example of which is a homily by Sophronios of Jerusalem who presents quite explicitly another point of view similar to that of the canon. Mary is worried that the messenger is not sent by God, but by Satan. The homily is lacking all the erotic tension that Arendsen's characterization of Romanos' work describes. But as I argued above, even in Romanos, we can see this demonic suspicion against Gabriel, I would say. Coming closer to the date of the canon's creation, or even after the creation of Odes, eight and nine, if we accept the hypothesis, they are an earlier piece of hymnography integrated in the canon at a later date. There is a famous sermon on the Annunciation by Yermanos of Constantinople that includes a long poetic dialogue between Gabriel and Mary, and after that between Mary and Joseph, following an alphabetic acrostic. So it is some kind of hybrid between preaching and poetry. In this Ethiopia, Mary is somewhat irritated by Gabriel's visit and her consent occurs as if she, out of tiredness, wants the angel to stop talking and thus agrees to become the mother of God. But during the course of the dialogue, both previously mentioned aspects are present. Mary is amazed by the beauty of the young man, but she is then more worried that the messenger is trying to deceive her. And indeed, in the eighth order of the canon, Mary expresses her concerns. I quote, I am filled with joy at thy words, yet am afraid. I fear lest thou deceive me as Eve was deceived, and lead me far from God. Yet lo, thou criest out, O all ye works of the Lord, bless ye the Lord. And Gabriel answers, See, thy difficulty is resolved, said Gabriel to this. Thou hast well said that this matter is hard to grasp. Obey then the words of thine own lips. Doubt not as though it were deceitful, but O all ye works of the Lord, bless ye the Lord. And Gabriel answers, See, thy difficulty is resolved, said Gabriel to this. Thou hast well said that this matter is hard to grasp. Obey then the words of thine own lips. Doubt not as though it were deceitful, but believe in this thing as very truth. For I cry, rejoicing, O oh, all your works of the Lord, bless you the Lord. End of the quote. From the canon, all so-called erotic tendencies are absent, as we noted above, and the typological theme of Mary being the second Eve who refuses to be cheated by the snake is much more prominent. And we saw this already in Eudocia's poem. Accordingly, it will be fascinating to suggest that the Annunciation Canon presents a newly established monastic Mary, whose virginity is not only a preordained mystery, but also a result of her own ascetic struggle. This seems to be an emerging trend in the seventh century as we saw in Sophronius' homily, but especially from the eighth or at latest ninth century onwards, when, for example, the Feast of the Entrance with its monastic tendencies was also introduced to the festal calendar. This also has implications on the interpretation of the dialogue between Mary and Gabriel in the, in the Annunciation. In the eighth century, Germanos of Constantinople and Andrew of Crete, for example, suggest that the incarnation would have actually happened before Gabriel arrived to marry. This would only be possible if we want to retain the importance of her own consent in the process of the incarnation. This 
also has implications on the interpretation of the dialogue between Mauri and Gabriel in the, in the Annunciation. In the 8th century, Germanos of Constantinople and Andrew of Crete, for example, suggest that the incarnation would have actually happened before Gabriel arrived to Mary. This would only be possible if we want to retain the importance of her own consent in the process of the incarnation, that Mary's implicit consent to God was an act of a longer period of time, and it manifested itself through her ascetic lifestyle. Perhaps Mary's verbal consent to Gabriel then, as the Gospel of Luke tells us, was interpreted more as a relieved confession to the archangel, who was, after examination, seen by her as a messenger of God. One would not want to reveal the mystery of incarnation to a demon. However, such ideas still remain conjecture. Much more study is needed in order to form a full diachronic image of this idea of the Theotokos as an ideal monastic, which eventually led to the dedication of the monastic community of Mount Athos to the Mother of God in the 10th century. This is actually something I am working on, uh, a monograph on the so-called monastic Theotokos. In my title, I promised that the dialogue of the Annunciation would be an auditory and visual dialogue. And in this visuality, two dimensions can be seen in this matter. First of them being the space and way of performing the hymns. When we hear the canon, the musical performance of canons happened antiphonally. It means by two choirs or chanters, a tradition that continues in Greek churches and not only up until our day. And each chanter or group took over the role of one of the speakers of the dialogue. In this way, the chanters created a stereo soundscape and the dialogue was enhanced by the auditory perception of the faithful. But this feeling was reinforced through believers' visual senses. In several Byzantine church buildings, as you can see from the picture here, which is the main church of the Stavro Nikita monastery in Mount Athos, the Annunciation is depicted as a divided two-part composition on two columns on both sides of the icon screen, and it is also customarily depicted in the holy doors. And so you have to look both left and right and combine these two seemingly separate icons into one scene. Thus the dialogue receives a textual, visual and auditory expression simultaneously, bombing the faithful senses with the dialogue. But there is also another level of the connection. In some Annunciation icons, but especially in the opening scenes of the Akathistos series, Mary initially rejects the angel, taking a recoiling stance as her hand makes a defensive gesture, while in the next scene she eagerly leans towards Gabriel to accept the message. Here you can see 16th century frescoes from the Trapeza, the refectory of our monastery, Xenophondos, by the iconographer Antonios. These are two first scenes of the uh, Akathistos series in the Trapeza. Byzantine chant, the musical tradition that was born together with Byzantine hymnography, includes in a way two musical systems. And this brings us back to the audit to accept the message. Here you can see 16th century fresco from the Trapeza, the refectory of our monastery, Xenophondos, by the iconographer Antonios. These are two first scenes of the uh, Akathistos series in the Trapeza. Byzantine chant, the musical tradition that was born together with Byzantine hymnography, includes, in a way, two musical systems. And this brings us back to the auditory dialogue. Independent melodies are one of the systems, and the second one is the system of contrafacta, model melodies, called aftolmela or irmi, in the case of hymnographic genre called canon, that are musically and metrically imitated by other hymns, called prosomia or troparia. The reason for such an imitational system, I think, is primarily practical. With a repertoire of hundreds of modern stanzas, one can easily perform an immense bulk of liturgical hymns, tens of thousands of them, without having to learn the music for each of them separately. However, for the Byzantines, every practical phenomenon also had its spiritual interpretation. Thus also here, the practical model melody system was exploited to create theological interconnections between liturgical feasts and themes. I call this musical intertextuality. 
Above, we discuss the canon for Annunciation and indeed its musical structures linked with the other Marian feasts. The studied canon up until 07 follows the so called standard Marian Irmi, found in several canons sung on two other major feasts of the Theotokos. Uh, the entrance on November 21st and the Dormition on August 15th. Additionally, the Irmi of Odes 8 and 9 are used as Irmi for the respective Odes of the Canon of the Entrance and its four feasts. The use of these similar Irmi, the similar melodies, echoes memories from the other Marian feasts in the mind of the faithful. So there's a soundscape that creates a network of cross references between feasts. Moreover, there is a particular mimetic connection between the festal canons of entrance and annunciation. The two last odes of the first canon of the feast of the entrance, as well as the canon of its four feasts, imitate the dialogue between Mary and Gabriel. But in this case, the persons involved in the discussion are Anne, Mary's mother, and the high priest Zacharias. It is evident that this part of the entrance canon is structured in deliberate imitation of its annunciation counterpart which is a dialogue par excellence, as we noted above. However, this does not mean that in the context of a whole year of liturgical celebrations, the canon of the Annunciation would be free from connotations with the entrance. Instead, the interrelation form, forms a circular effect. All feasts that participate in the creation of the whole of the soundscape provide meanings to the others. Uh, so the faithful is not informed which canon kind of has the priority. In this case, the musical rendition of the hymn is closely connected to the rhetoric device of Ethiopia, and intertextuality attests itself both on musical and textual levels, as we can see here. The canon of the four feasts of the entrance, for example, begins its eight ode with the words of Anna, and I quote, Anna said to Zacharias, hearken and understand, O wise elder, with a brave soul, the pure child that I begot from divine will, for through her will redemption come. Take her to the holy temple and cry out, all works of the Lord, praise the Lord. End of quote. And in the following three torparia, the dialogue continues between Zacharias and Anna, the speaker changing in each stanza. When comparing this ode with the canon of the Annunciation, Anna seems to perform the role of Gabriel. She is the one who is truly aware of the meaning of the entrance, while Zacharias imitates Mary's reserved position in the Annunciation canon. Thus, the author of the poem uses the rhetorical device of Ethiopia to express the characters of the persons involved in the dialogue. This seems logical, considering the setting of the entrance. Just as Gabriel brought the message of the conception of Jesus, so did Anna enter the temple to bring Mary to Zacharias. Thus, this dialogue between Zacharias and Anna, which does not exist as such in narrative sources of the life of Mary, becomes a kind of prefiguration of the dialogue between Mary and Gabriel. And this connects these two feasts thematically to each other very strongly. So, today we have seen how varied the reading of a single short gospel dialogue in the liturgical tradition can be extending from different hermeneutical readings to images and sounds and creating a network of cross-references between these different feasts. This kind of understanding of a gradual unfolding of the truth is exactly how the Orthodox Church understands the entrance of the faithful into the divine mysteries. This is only one example from the vast richness of Byzantine hymnography, and we can only learn its treasures through active participation in the liturgical life of the Church, through chanting, hearing, reading, and seeing. So I thank you all for your attention, and I am open for any questions or comments uh, that you might have. Thank you very much. Father Damaskinos, are you with us? Yes, I'm with you. Uh, for some reason, I can start my video, but I can hear you and see you. Uh, only a word is enough. <laughs> it's wonderful to hear your words. Um, in a moment, I'll open uh, the floor to questions from our in-person and online participants. I'm Peter Buteneff. I'm happy to meet you virtually. Um, I'm very, very grateful on behalf of all of us for this uh, auditory 
visual uh, and emotional dialogue as you presented it. Uh, I think among the questions that I imagine we might have uh, is many of us are coming from parish settings and in some cases uh, where a full festal matins is not going to be a reality on the day of uh, the Feast of the Annunciation. And uh, might you have any uh, practical suggestions as to how to uh, make this dialogue, which is so full of theology and, and of, of kind of gut-wrenchingly beautiful uh, emotional theological content, uh, how to make that live and breathe in a parish setting that that may not be able to do a full festal matins. Uh, that might be one question I, I would lead with, and then we would uh, open the floor to our um, in-person and online participants. Yeah, thank you, first of all, so much for inviting me. And I once more want to apologize not being there in person, because this, uh, this year is a year when all the conferences from the pandemic uh, kind of accumulated and uh, I've been running from one conference to another and I'm now here in Europe attending another conference this week. Um, so, well, first of all, um, this is not only a parish problem, there's also problems in monasteries that liturgical texts are not always uh, presented in their fullness. And what I would just suggest is, uh, at least because we're not used to performing canons in their full form uh, in most places, perhaps in uh, many of the monasteries on, on the Holy Month we do, but in, in most other monasteries, uh, this is not done. But I would say that for Annunciation especially, because this canon is uh, a whole, or actually consists of two holes, uh, it would be very important to uh, actually seeing it as a whole poem. Uh, and uh, see the whole dramatic development in the dialogue throughout the hymn. So that's perhaps my practice of practical suggestion that we can uh, deviate from our usual parish practices, at least for this one feast, and, and try to realize in, a, in, in some kind of way. Uh, the other question is, of course, the musical tradition. In Greek churches, it's uh, easier to sing the whole canon because it's metrical poetry and we have the modern melodies for use. But in the Russian tradition, it's not very common to sing whole canons. And of course, this is a musical challenge, but at least when it would be read by two readers, there would be some kind of dialogical element in the performance of the poem as well. Thank you, Father. Hi, Father. It's John Boyer. I Hi, believe John. last time last time I saw you was in a sauna in uh, in Yonsu. Um, uh, I absolutely loved your your talk, and I wanted to. Um, oh, there was one thing that occurred to me, and I believe it was one of the Kondakia that you read that uh, we don't uh, often get a chance to um, experience those texts uh, liturgically, where the uh, the Virgin Mary describes the angel as having uh, adorned her with words, right? Uh, uh, hung words on me as ornaments. And the thing yeah. that occurred to me is that to us now, when we hear something like that, um, it sounds something like something rather sort of um, uh literary right if, if um the, because we we associate words with the written word and with whatever concepts that those might evoke but i'm thinking that to um uh, an older mindset um that that would refer to a spoken word or indeed a sung word Right. So to what extent, I mean, I just that one image struck me so, um, so strongly that was she in fact saying uh, that he adorned me uh, by his singing. 
right? I mean, that, I'm sure that's a bit of a stretch, but that was one of the things that uh, uh, that occurred to me. And I'm just wondering if, if anything similar uh, has occurred to you while, while looking at these texts. Anyway, thanks very much for your talk. It was gorgeous. Thank you, John, for the question. Um, so first of all, there's a, I do actually think that the understanding it's a, some kind of singing is a bit of a stretch. But um, there's something in the whole idea of words, and especially in the events of the Annunciation, because the patristic understanding of Annunciation was that the conception happened through words. So actually, Gabriel's words entered the ears of Mary, and that, that was the way the conception happened. So instead of uh, sexual intercourse, they had this uh, vocal intercourse uh, in a way. But the other thing is also that um, we as modern people, we have a very different understanding of what words and language and speech and texts are uh, that the Byzantines had. And especially from the middle Byzantine period onwards, a little bit after Romanos, but also there was hints towards this before Romanos. Uh, words, first of all, they did not have a fixed meaning in the sense that uh, we would understand that uh, a text or language would only have one uh, possible interpretation or one stable meaning. Um, this is what in philosophy we would call kind of a structuralist understanding of language. But uh, instead, in, uh, in the Byzantine understanding of language, each uh, word was perceived by its hearer, in this case, Mary, and she was kind of the only person who could perceive Gabriel's word in this way, that it actually resulted in God being conceived in her womb. So uh, this is a very unique uh, way of hearing that Mary has. But the other thing is also that the Byzantines understood that even though every hearer kind of affects the way the word conveys meanings, is that every word also has a true participation of the thing it refers to. So all the things are symbolic, all, all words are symbolic. And it's kind of the same thing as we understand in the theology of the icon, that, okay, the icon is not the saint himself, but when we look at the icon and we venerate the icon, we have true participation of communication with this person. The person is somehow communicating with us in reality, not only metaphorically or uh, as an idea or as a thought in our heads. So this is how the Byzantines also understood language and words. So when, when Gabriel says to Mary that the Holy Spirit will overshadow you, uh, it actually is the presence of Holy Spirit that he conveys to her. Uh, because uh, every time we say the name of God, he is present uh, symbolically through that name. And uh, we often, as modern people, we don't understand this whole weight that uh, language and words carry in this uh, Byzantine symbolic understanding of language. So that's what I would say as a comment to that. Hello, Father. My name is Samuel Popiel. And I just had a quick question is about the development of the canon. Can we say, practically speaking, it was the fruit of the contemplation of these saints? And, and obviously, that's the, the work of the church to compile them. Um, that's, that's how I would sum up my question. Yeah, so there's also, as I said, this kind of uh, relates to my previous answer about the character of language is that because um, language as such or words as such in the Byzantine understanding don't have one meaning, they have several meanings. And this uh, way of kind of writing both sermons and hymns, like the canon, it's kind of rewritten version of the gospel dialogue. But it's also a version to reveal something that the gospel dialogue does not reveal to us. So it's a way to uh, gradually unfold these hidden meanings of words and language because there are symbols. Uh, so that's why you can actually create several different versions that the interpretate, interpret the dialogue in a very different way. So it's kind of uh, this uh, whole debate about what is the correct interpretation of Annunciation is not very relevant for the Byzantine mind, but actually all these different impressions you receive from different kinds of hymns. And even in the Annunciation Canon, as I said, it's actually composed of two different canons that present the dialogue in two different ways. So even in this one hymn that we nowadays perceive as one hymn, 
uh, we see two different versions of the dialogues. And we could say kind of like, this is a bit oversimplified, but we could say that both of them are equally true uh, because they, they gradually unfold this mystery of annunciation and the whole idea of this conception of Mary. But then again, as I said, also in the talk, we have all this vagueness regarding the authorship of these poems. We don't actually know who, who wrote them for sure. We have no idea. And this is also something that the church, we often nowadays, uh, because we see church as a very organized institution and also because of uh, the technological means we have nowadays, uh, the church can actually like micromanage every part of it. Uh, the Pope, for example, from Rome can actually control what's happening in the Amazons because of internet. But if you think a thousand years ago, the church didn't have this uh, possibility. So there was much less kind of this uh, centralized control of things. And this was also applied to any kind of interpretation of the scriptures, for example. It just happened naturally by these people around the, um, around the empire and outside the empire. And they kind of brought their own spiritual visions to this collection of several different spiritual visions of the same event. And then the overall idea of faithful in the church has is an assembly of all these different readings, uh, different uh, understandings, different uh, aspects, different dimensions of the dialogue. Uh, hi, Father. I've got a question from the online community. Um, Rosemary is asking if you have any further comments on the purple thread. Yeah, the purple thread. Um, to be honest, I don't, I don't remember if I what I said in the poem, but as I said, it's um, it's mentioned in the Proto Evangelium of James as the handicraft that the Theotokos did after leaving the temple, and this is uh, actually linked to this historical fact that we know uh, when the Temple of Jerusalem was destroyed in the year seventy A.D. by the Roman troops, uh, there was a group of temple virgins whose task was to uh, weave this scarlet thread or purple thread for the, for the veil of the Holy of Holies. And they, uh, they threw themselves into fire when, when the Roman troops came. So this uh, historical account that we have about the uh, destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem tells that there was a group of virgins living in the temple and they did this work of uh, weaving, weaving uh, the purple thread. So this also reveals to us that the Theotokos was one of these temple virgins as the Proto-Evangelium of James. This is a uh, states. So this is some of, this has been uh, disputed by many historians that it, this would not be possible. But as I said, we have this one historical evidence that is quite, quite um, reliable. And so she was one of the virgins who lived an ascetical life in the temple of Jerusalem. That's one of the things the purple thread re refers to. But of course, the purple thread also has um, uh, an allegorical meaning, and that's the royal meaning, because purple is the royal color, and Mary is the queen who gives birth to the king. And this whole idea of this purple color being woven by her uh, is one of the things. And one of the in possible interpretations is also the incarnation itself, because uh, in many allegorical images, the womb of Mary is called a workshop or a dairy house where uh, uh, cheese is being made or where the, the union of God and man is being woven. And this is an image that, for example, Proclus of Constantinople in the fifth century uh, uses. So also this act of weaving that Mary does while the incarnation happens in the Annunciation uh, tells us of the union of God a man in the person of Christ. Um, it's Peter again. I, I think in, in the vast majority of iconographic depictions of the Annunciation, Mary is holding a drop spindle, uh, basic kind of precursor to the spinning wheel, which is how uh, she was spinning thread. Uh, and then in the uh, mosaics in the uh, in the church of the Hora in, uh, in Constantinople, uh, she's being taught how to spin by her parents also. Uh, I wondered where this and other dialogues are sung in the church. 
uh, since our theme these days at this institute has to do with choices of repertoire and how to evoke um, hymnography in the best way for its uh, proclamation and reception in the parish. Uh, are there any hints that you could suggest, uh, whether in the Byzantine or the Slavic traditions, for uh, uh, that pertain to repertoire and performance that would evoke the dialogical character of what is being sung? Well, first of all, uh, the antiphonal performance is uh, very essential in this. So it would be very important to have two singer groups or two solo singers uh, doing this dialogue. And um, I'm uh, perhaps a little bit cautious about more dramatization of this. So I think the antiphonal singing is okay, but what we would uh, need perhaps, it would be some kind of musical um, setting that would serve the dialogical structure well. Um, of course, as I said, in the Greek tradition, we have the modern melodies that kind of dictate how the melody should be sung, but uh, in the, the Russian tradition, because uh, canon melodies are uh, very uh, recitative-like, so they have a lot of uh, repetition of single notes, they're perhaps not the best ones to understand the meaning of the text, so it would be nice if somebody did also choral settings of these canons that would be perhaps melodically a little bit more interesting. And in this way, they would uh, serve the word a little bit better so that the faithful would actually understand what's being sung. But I, I think these two practical instructions would be the most important ones so that there's actually an antiphonal performance by two groups or by two singers and that the musical, musical setting somehow works, serves the understanding of the words themselves. Father Damaskinos, this is Harrison. It's nice to meet you finally. Thank you for your patience with all my emails. Um, I, I have a comment rather than a question, and I'd invite you to respond. The, you, you connected these three feasts very beautifully, uh, the, the Annunciation, the Entrance, and the Meeting. Um, they all also have very similar iconographic representations of that left to right reception uh, in the entrance, uh, Mary being received into the temple and at the meeting, uh, Jesus being presented uh, uh, to, to, to the elder, Zacharias. Um, and of course, in Annunciation, there is also a sort of presentation, except it's it's absent. It's there's something missing from the middle, which is, as as John pointed out, it is that word. Um, and and the thing that struck me was when you pointed out how in um, I forget which uh, church you said that was from Manathos was that uh, Stavonikita. Uh, the iconography of the um, uh, angel and Mary. And then also on the holy doors, and that is, of course, one of the traditional uh, places for the the iconography of the Annunciation is on the holy doors. Either it's usually either the Annunciation split left and right door, or the four evangelists, uh, at least as far as I know. So it, it occurs to me that, in a sense, that reception of the word that we see in that icon is the liturgical action that happens through those doors as well. We receive the word of the gospel and we receive uh the, the eucharist the 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 gift of god um so uh, that was just one thought that i had in, in responding to your lecture but thank you very much and and invite you for any comments or feedback yeah it's um it's actually interesting um i think i wrote in my doctoral dissertation if i remember correctly it's been so many years that i don't remember exactly what i wrote but there's a church in cappadocia i think the good and the chapel uh, that includes uh, on opposite sides of the chapel, the presentation of Christ into the temple and the entry of the mother of God into the temple. And of course, these feasts are, um, they look very similar. But what is surprising is that actually there are not many hymnographic connections between these two feasts, but that's another point. Um, that's not that much related to the Annunciation. But as you said, there's always this same element of somebody coming from the left uh, bringing something. And of, of course, in the Annunciation icons also, there is uh, the presence of the Word of God, which is uh, 
presented by the, I don't know how you call it in English, in Greek, you call it doxa, the, the symbol of God's presence, this half circle in the upper, upper side of the icon and a beam coming towards the Theotokos. So that's the Holy Spirit descending to her and, and causing the conception. Um, so that's also kind of visible in the icons. And actually one of the interesting things is that in the depictions of the entrance, for example, there are uh, in many icons, they are composed in a kind of comic-like way, with comic, I don't mean comical, but comic like, like a drawn narrative kind of way. So Mary is actually depicted three times in the icons. First, when she's being brought to the temple by her parents, then when she is received by Zacharias in the temple. And then the third one is inside the Holy of Holies, where she's sitting uh, on the stairs of the sanctuary. And Gabriel is coming to her and bringing communion. Or he's bringing bread, but that's the prefiguration of communion. So actually, Mary received communion before communion had been installed uh, by Christ on earth. And um, so this is a, this, that's a very good point that it happens through the royal doors. And all of these uh, th three events, the entrance, the annunciation, and the, and the, and the presentation, they, there's always this uh, something happening at the doors of the sanctuary. Only in the Annunciation, it's not the, actually the sanctuary, but it's the doors of the house of Mary. And in many dialogical uh, texts, for example, there's a sermon, anonymous sermon from the sixth century, where Gabriel arrives to the house of Mary. And there's this long, long monologue of him thinking how he should enter. And uh, he's, uh, he's thinking that, okay, God told me not to make her angry or not to make her scared. And then Gabriel uh, concludes that, okay, I will go in and say rejoice. So at least in that way, uh, she will not, uh, not be too scared. But Mary is even in that situation, she's kind of in the Holy of Holies. Like her house is a sanctuary in itself and Gabriel is afraid of going in. So of course, it's always this idea of her being in some way in the altar and uh, carrying Christ in herself. And of course, this is the image of her being the altar of the temple uh, that carries God. So she is also the Eucharistic vessel in a way. So that was a very accurate comment. And nice to meet you too, even if uh, via Zoom. Well, Father Kitos, Thank you so, so much for uh, the lecture, the content of it, and the spirit of it, uh, and also for interacting with us uh, online and in person. Uh, I bid you a good night in Thessaloniki, and uh, I hope this is one of many collaborations that we enjoy together with uh, our Institute of Sacred Arts here at the seminary. God willing. Thank you once more for the invitation, and I wish you very fruitful days at the Summer Institute. Thank you. Let's uh, extend our appreciation.